rigged it up. Okay. So, session PowerShell on Mac OS. I'm John Welch. I'm a senior systems administrator with Honeywell in Kansas City. Um, I've been a part of the Mac IT world since the late 1990s. Um, grew up on things like NetOctopus, very early versions of FileWave. Um, Pre-Casper, before it became just Jamf. Um, anyone remember AppleShare IP? A lot of work on that. So I've been, I've been doing this for a while. Um, some of you know me, I may have had some opinions on installers, automation, user interface, once or twice. Um, one of the first things I really did interesting with uh, management tools was I was using NetOctopus and I realized they had an amazing Apple script dictionary to where I could actually script registry changes on NT Server 4 from Apple script. It was kind of crazy, a little bit weird, but it was very cool. Uh, Anyway, anyway, you remember Sal Segoy, and I showed him that and how you could take down an NT box just by deleting registry keys one after the other. He said I was absolutely evil, and we got along really great after that. Um, today's topic is something that, that has existed for a while, but it's very much underappreciated, so I'm, and I really dig it as a tool, which is PowerShell on Mac OS. <laughs> yes, PowerShell. Um, it's been around for a while now. It's updated fairly regularly. Um, just a heads up, in 60 to 75 minutes, we are not doing a deep dive. You are not going to come out of here knowing a lot about, a lot about PowerShell, how to do stuff, but about what you can do with it is kind of my goal here. Um, when it comes to tools, I'm really indifferent at the end of the day. The tool does the job correctly for the job I needed to do in the context the job exists in. It's a good tool. If it doesn't, then it's not a good tool. Um, I, like having an access, I like having access to a wide range of tools. It just gives me better options. There is no one true tool, even though the Mac IT community is as vulnerable to that sort of thinking as any other community. Within Windows, you know, Intune, SCCM is the one true tool. I have done a lot of work with other Windows admins, getting them to realize that even PowerShell is an acceptable substitute for DOS language especially if you're doing AD stuff, the workarounds those guys will go through to avoid PowerShell and one line of code is amazing. <laughs> um, every tool has its positives and negatives and it very much depends on the context. What works in one situation is absolute bad in another. A more formal way of putting it is this quote here. And this comes from a book called Range by David Epstein. Um, and if it's, it's basically a book of why generalists do really well in a specialized world. Um, the more you know, the wider your range of knowledge, the higher chance you have of solving the problems. And one of the examples in the book was when the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill happened in Alaska. One of the problems they had was when you pull oil out of basically frozen water, it's sludge. So they could get it out of the ocean into the boats, but they couldn't pump it out of the boats real easy because it's basically peanut butter at that point. And so one of the first examples of crowdsourcing. They put it out on the internet. How do we fix this? Because they have all these petroleum engineers, but they're going at it from a petroleum engineer point of view. So they really don't understand how to fix this. And this guy who had never done anything with oil, petroleum, or any sort of chemical engineering, but he had worked a construction job when he was in high school. And one of the problems they had was they had a cement truck down at the bottom of a hill, and they had to get the cement up to the top of the hill, and they couldn't pipe it up. They had to do it in wheelbarrows. Cement sets rather quickly. But with the way they prevented that, you can get these things at Home Depot, is you basically take an electric motor or a gas motor, an off-center cylindrical rod about three feet long, you shove it down into concrete, hit the button, it starts jiggling really fast. And it keeps the cement from settling. So he said, why don't you try that? And they did. Except they did a super tanker size one, shoved it down to a hole full of peanut butter, and it liquefied the oil that fast. Sometimes the weird solutions are the ones that work. Like PowerShell. Um, Background, it's been generally available on Mac OS since 2018. Started with PowerShell Core 6.0, that was very limited. The current version is in the sevens, much more feature complete. Um, it also works well with .NET uh, 6.x, 7.x, .NET 8.x is in public beta. So you can actually do a lot beyond just general PowerShell stuff. You can bring in a lot of .NET stuff too, which is a huge help. Versions, long-term, 
is 7.2, the stable is 7.3, the preview's currently on 7.4, I think they just dropped 7.45. Um, it's available both on Intel and Apple Silicon, along with uh, .NET 6 and 7, and eventually 8 are also native for Intel or Apple Silicon, so you don't have to worry about um, dealing with that nonsense. Supported OS versions on Intel 10.13, on Apple Silicon, Mac OS 11, and later. You can get it. That's the primary PowerShell GitHub from Microsoft, right there, PowerShell, PowerShell. Um, it's also available via Homebrew, so you can use Cask to install it. I cannot remember if Mac Ports has it. I do not believe they do. Obviously, there's some differences from Windows. Um, there's no Windows-specific items, so you don't have any of the WMI commands, the CIM commands, because that literally does not exist on Mac OS. Um, there's a very handy command in Windows called Git Computer Info, which gives you all this Active Directory and Registry info that has, doesn't exist on Mac OS, so that doesn't exist either. Um, there's no application scripting. Office only supports AppleScript or VBA, unless you're talking about Outlook, in which they have a very old and desperately in need of update AppleScript dictionary because it doesn't recognize MS365 accounts. They should fix that. Um, there's some other things that don't, that don't exist, that exist on Windows, like PowerShell Diagnostics some job scheduling things. Obviously, it is not a shipping component of Mac OS. I, I don't feel like that needs to be said, but I've had a couple of people go, I can't find it. I'm like, did you install it? No, okay. <laughs> Step one. Um, there's a lot of built-in functionality, a lot of Azure AWS modules, and I mean a lot of, so as it turns out, the AWS team uses a lot of PowerShell on Linux. Well, PowerShell on Linux, PowerShell on Mac OS are very similar. So all the modules that work on Linux also tend to work on Mac OS. So you get an insane amount of um, AWS modules for free. A lot of the Azure modules, the official ones, work really well on Mac OS. Um, also remoting via SSH, so you can, I, you can connect to other Windows machines and servers via a variety of methods. You can also connect to other Unix-based machines, Linux servers, um, Mac OS desktops if you want. Um, it supports SSH keys, that kind of thing. It integrates really well with Shell and AppleScript. Um, one of the problems that PowerShell has on any platform, but especially on Mac OS, is that there's not a lot of, if you want to like on Windows, do like a display dialog or have someone choose from a list, you are doing a lot of work building that dialog by hand. You can't just say choose from a list, here's a bunch of options. But what you can do is if you use OSA script inside of PowerShell, you can feed it display dialog, choose application, choose from list, and you know you set a variable to it, and it'll spit the results back out into the variable. So you can you can take advantage of the Apple Script UI primitives with PowerShell, and you don't have to do all that work yourself. Um, basically, any shell command you can run um, without a whole lot of work at all. PowerShell also has some Unix semantics, so things like ls, cd, that kind of thing. Um, not, you're not gonna do like shell scripting in PowerShell, I don't know why you'd want to. But you can, you can get a lot of the basics done without having to learn the Apple, the, uh, the bash versions, the PowerShell versions. You can just use uh, shell. That was, there's probably more, that was around a month ago when I last looked. If you go to PowerShell Gallery, that is where all of this exists, most of the modules. There's about 700 there, they're all very useful. There's even some Jamf stuff in there. And I mean, really, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this later, you can write PowerShell modules in PowerShell. So if you want, if you're using Kanji, and there's some command line utilities you want to wrap into something else, absolutely you can wrap it into PowerShell, make it a module, you're good to go. Very portable. There is no weird directories. Once you get to user local, Microsoft, PowerShell, the version number, that's the entire PowerShell install. So technically, you can, if you're building an app, you can take that PowerShell directory, shove it into the resources folder within the app bundle, and you now have access to PowerShell within your app. I am not a lawyer. I have no idea what the licensing implications of this are, or if it's allowable at all. Please go talk to a lawyer about lawyer things, not a sysadmin, because I will give you, at best, not correct advice, which with lawyer stuff is expensive. It's highly extensible. 
Um, as I said, one of the big advantages of PowerShell is you can write PowerShell modules in PowerShell. You don't have to C or anything else. Um, I talked earlier about the Git Computer Info module for Windows. Um, I wrote in an, an analog of it um, called Git Mac Info, and I'll show it to you here in a second. Um, it uses some built-in PowerShell features. It uses some shell script commands. It uses Apple script. It just, it was partially, that was the best way to get it done, but it was also a neat demo of how PowerShell can talk to anything. Um, so you get a lot of functionality at all levels of the OS in one place, and as we'll see, PowerShell's syntax is remarkably nice compared to about everything else. So let me shell out of this. And where is, oh, there you are, Visual Studio Code. So this is Git Mac Info. There's a bunch of stuff going here. It grabs stuff out of, um, oh, okay, yeah, let me slide it over, thank you. So there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, it pulls stuff out of System Profiler. Um, it pulls stuff out of, I have started adding Apple Silicon code into it. It's still a little wonky. I don't actually have an Apple Silicon Mac. Um, SysControl, Apple Script, stuff like that. So, and because I have it as a module, I don't have to do anything special. I can just do Git, Mac. Oh, look, there it is. Hit Enter. It's going to think about it. Bring that up a bit. And so here's all kinds of useful info on my Mac, right there. But because PowerShell is, is a very kind of a, a training wheels object-oriented language, you can do some neat stuff with it. So let's, ha let's assign that a variable. Okay, it's gonna do its thing. So now if I do, we see the same thing. But let's say I just want um, boot device, right? So I do, oh wait, forgot, of course I did. So if I wanna just use certain parts of that, in, a, in another script, I just shove it into the variable, and then if I just want the boot device, I don't have to do a lot of said grep text parsing. It's just the part I care about right there. And that's your, that's your object syntax in PowerShell is, is variable dot parameter. Um, so that's kind of handy, you know, especially, you know, the, the less, yes, said and grep and all those are very good, but if you don't have to do that constantly because you're not dealing with a language that thinks everything is a string, it's kind of handy. Um, this is up on my GitHub, and I have links to that at the end of the Prezo. Um, but yeah. As I alluded to, it understands a wide variety of data types natively. So it actually has built-in commands for specifically dealing with comma-separated values. You don't have to do a lot of parsing for that. I do that um, at work. I'm, I manage license servers for things like Autodesk, software, SolidWorks, things like that that have roaming license servers. Uh, we have a monitoring system for that, that when someone logs in to use an app, it grabs their user ID, but it doesn't grab their name, their email, and anything else. But that's all in Active Directory. So what I do is I do an Active Directory pull, pull out the right info, turn that in, in, in to get the department number that I need, I import a comma-separated list that's got all the departments on it with the actual department number and then the department number that the tool I use uses internally. And I just go down to that to pull department numbers. But that's literally import CSV. You can assign the headers to whichever field you want. There's no, again, you're not parsing the text directly. You're dealing with it as a series of fields. JSON XML, there's a ton of JSON in XML features, commands built into uh, PowerShell. It has built-in object types, um, like actual object types, not kind of trying to pretend like an array is a big text string type thing. Um, you can make your own custom classes. We'll see that a little bit later if I have the time. So you can create your own object types, um, including functions within the class. Like you can really do it up and you don't have, you're not leaving PowerShell at any time to do that. You can do that all within the language. Multiple list and array types. It does generic, it does um, regular arrays. It does what would, in, in Apple speak, be mutable arrays. It does key value pairs, all of it. And again, you can customize it if you need to. 
Um, and the nice thing is, is it's not just parsing text until you want to jump in front of a truck. There's also an advantage, you can also bring in stuff directly from .NET. If you have .NET installed on the machine you're running the script on, you now get a lot of the .NET feature set on your Mac, so you can do even more stuff. Um, you can directly, if now again, what's supported on .NET on the Mac and what's supported on .NET on Windows, obviously very different things. There's just things that don't exist. For some odd reason, they haven't, I, I hope they fix this, there's none of the, the, the UI tools sets that are in .NET, so you really do have to use like AppleScript or something else if you want a UI in front of your uh, PowerShell script. Um, but you get a lot of that, and so like one thing I was talking about before, where's VS Code? So this is the thing, um, if you haven't, if you don't know um, Rich Troughton, He's here today. Uh, this is a PowerShell version of a script he wrote that basically goes in, grabs all the available software updates for a machine, lists it out with an index number, uh, the name, and the version. And use, it uses the version to actually pull down the update you want. It doesn't install it, it just downloads it. Um, I thought that would be a cool thing to, to move over to PowerShell, partially for this, but also just because I do that sometimes. It's how I learn how to do interesting things on PowerShell. But the problem was, is that there's a lot of, like you'll have like for Monterey, you're gonna have like seven things that are Monterey, Monterey, Monterey. So if you're trying to do say a uh, hash table in PowerShell, which is just a list of key value pairs, there's repeating things so it just doesn't play, errors out. There's a lot of ways around it. I could have appended stuff onto the name. I could have done like an array with individual sets of key value pairs and just made myself crazy with it. Or I could do what I did there, which is I created a class called OS Update, which has three strings. The title, the index, which you use to pick the version you want, and the version number. And that just gets shoved in there. So it goes along, it runs the command software update, listful installers. It removes the first two lines because that's garbage that I don't really need for the script. And it's two lines, so I just did each line individually. Just kept removing the first line until I get what I want. Um, then it goes through each individual item in the uh, array list, which is set up as a, a mutable array. Um, an array. Actually, in PowerShell, it's an array list. And it just starts pulling things from it. It pulls the, it creates a string array, it pulls the title, it pulls the version number, pulls out any um, leading spaces. And then there's some weird stuff in here because as it turns out, the, the read host step which is how you get the user input in a command line. If you don't do things in a certain way, it will, it will block the right host commands that tell people what to enter. So it's like it's waiting for you to enter stuff, and as soon as you hit anything and hit enter, then it shows you all the stuff you needed to see what you actually were trying to enter. So that's, that's a little dysfunctional there. But let me move this back up. The nice thing I love about VS Code is you can, it's, it's also a great text, uh, test environment. So like... Do, do, do. See, this should work. Yeah, see, and here's where hitting the, the read host thing. So I got a couple of bugs in there. But if I hit like three, it's going to start trying to download that. Yeah. <sighs> bugs are fun. But that's a general idea. But the nice thing is, is by be able, because I can create a custom class, I don't have to do a lot of weird workarounds to make up for the weaknesses in other data structures. I just created my own. And that's something that's, you can do in things like Python to a certain extent. You can, I imagine you could fake it in Bash. I just wouldn't want to. Like that definitely hits the diminishing returns level. And it's nice that it's a built-in feature. So you can do this, you can have these things listed out, you can build modules with your custom classes in it and just refer back to them. So if you have a bunch of custom classes you use, you create a module and the, the Git Mac info module is again up on my PowerShell site. Creating modules is a little tricky, but it's not too bad. And you can then have those available whenever you need them. It is syntactically similar to C Sharp, but as I said, there's some Unix semantics in there. Um, this is one place where Microsoft is cleaning Apple's clock in two ways. First of all, PowerShell on Windows is a coherent OS-wide from bottom to top automation framework. The last time Apple had an OS-wide coherent single automation framework was Mac OS 9. They've never had one in 10. It's always been a pastiche of little shell, little Apple script, little this, little that, and you need to stitch it all together, and now you have a drinking problem. 
Uh, the other thing is because PowerShell is based on C-sharp, the more you use PowerShell, the more familiar you are with C-sharp syntax, especially as you start importing C-sharp modules. You're learning C-sharp without learning C-sharp. This came in really handy because, as I said, I, at work I managed something like 13, 14 license servers, all Windows, or one Linux, that each are running anywhere between four to 12 licensed services individually. We're trying to monitor that through SolarWinds. It's really tricky. Um, part of the problem is, is the way SolarWinds monitors things is the way a lot of network monitoring systems monitor things. All it does is say, hey, is this service running? If the answer is yes, it's good. Well, as anyone here has dealt with, especially like in the early days of HTTPD, you can have the daemon running and it's completely deaf. So yes, from the machine side, everything's fine, but the outside world is like, there's no web server here, there's no website. So what I did was I had the, I have this long PowerShell script that lets you pick the server, and then it, it uses external executables to query the license services the way the clients would from the outside. So the port, it's looking for specific responses, things like that. If there's not an executable, I can at least um, test to see if there's anything listening on the correct TCP port. So at least I know there's something there. I decided for my boss and for other people who wanted to do this without dealing with, you know, for a lot of people, the command line is legitimately um, intimidating. So I built a GUI version of it. Well, it's on Windows. Obviously, I'm going to use Visual Studio and C Sharp with it because that's, you know. And what I discovered was is because I'd done all this work in PowerShell, the documentation for the C Sharp equivalents was really easy to access. Building it out in C Sharp was really easy. Um, the hardest part was where Apple is cleaning Microsoft's clock is in building UIs <laughs> within your app and having it look the way when you run it, the way it does when you're building it. Because let me tell you, in Visual Studio, those two things do not sync up well at all. So it was like, okay, this looks good. Oh, look, all the dialogue fields are overlapping. Okay, let me start. Move it, move it, move it. Okay, no, nope, no, move it. Yeah, that was not fun. Um, for anybody interested, Visual Studio does exist on Mac OS. It is fairly full featured. You can build Windows apps from within, from a Mac. That's kind of terrifying and weird, but you can do it. Um, you still need Xcode for some things, and I, last I checked, it doesn't support Swift UI yet. I'm not surprised. I imagine getting that to work with a completely separate IDE will be a little work, a little tricky. But you can, Visual Studio lets you build iOS, iPad OS, watch, you know, the whole feature set. Um, that's Visual Studio, not Visual Studio Code. Big difference. Another place where Microsoft just runs over Apple. Um, excellent documentation. I mean, beyond, Apple doesn't have anything close to this. Um, let me see here. Do, do, do. So, this is the main PowerShell documentation site. It has, you know, downloading everything you'd want. They also support the community really, really well. Um, like, they have regular calls for the community. There's a couple of PowerShell sites, PowerShell.com, I think. Don't quote me on that one. Um, that are community sites for helping people. Microsoft is all in on that. They have a lot of, they have people dedicated, like the, the PowerShell team is massive at Microsoft. Um, they've got, you know, like I said, all kinds of resources. There's a, a site Microsoft's had for years. They recently got rid of it because the one guy who was running it retired and they decided to fold it into the larger PowerShell community. But if you ever heard of, hey, scripting guy, this was like one or two people at Microsoft and you would just, post on the site or you'd email him, hey, I'm having this problem with VBA or PowerShell or whatever, what's going on? And he'd just answer your question. He would hand you the answer. Microsoft paid this dude to help people who did automation who weren't coders. They were just people trying to stitch Word together right. I have been dealing with Apple Scripts since System 7 Pro when it first showed up. I have never seen Apple do that. And I don't think they ever will. It's not a question of resources. They just don't care. At this point, it's the only, it's the only explanation. Um, in terms of documentation, so you can pick anything. Uh, yeah, so Outhost. 
This is what you get. And this is for every PowerShell command you can find. And you can choose by PowerShell version, including betas, including very old versions. And you get sample code. You get what it should look like. And it goes through all the parameters, explains what it is. You can then link to that. And this is for everything. It's not just for a couple of things. Who here has gone to like Apple's developer docs? And all they have is the name of the, of the statement. It's like, it does this. How, how, pray tell, does it do this? Could you share this with us? That doesn't happen. Again, Apple is a $3 trillion company. I think they can hire a couple of tech writers who aren't Chris Breen. Chris does a great job, but he can't do everything. Um, related links, the whole thing. And this is for all of this. Like, the detail on this, you can search. You can search through different versions of things. And it's all right there. And this, this I live on this site because I've got so many links to this for stuff I use. Because that way I don't have to remember everything. It's just right there. Um, honestly, I think Apple has a bit of a, if you're, you know, real devs don't need documentation thing going on. I haven't seen a whole lot to dispute that. There's, there's a lot of ego at Apple. Gee, there's a shock. PowerShell community is highly supported by Microsoft. They bring people in on the reg to talk about what they want from PowerShell. They go out and visit with people who are using PowerShell in interesting ways. They love it. Um, one, of their biggest one of their biggest requests is, if you start using PowerShell on a Mac, please let the PowerShell team know, because they're kind of in the dark. As far as they know, it's Windows, Linux, and the Mac exists. They have no idea about usage. So if you do start using this, please manage to let somehow someone on the PowerShell team know they'll love you. Um, they really actively engage. I've gone to Ignite a few times. The PowerShell team will sit there and talk to you all day long. They do way more than just ignoring bug reports. As I said, it's cross-platform. It's at least as cross-platform as Shell, a little bit more. In terms of syntax, it's far more consistent. Um, a built-in command is not going to have really radically different syntax between platforms. The PowerShell community is very insistent that if you're going to do your own command, you're going to write your own C code, whatever, to create your own command that doesn't exist, that you do it the right way. There's a structure, follow the structure. They're not awful about it, but they can get a little snippy if you don't do it the right way. This. <laughs> this is so consistent. Um, the commands, basically every command in PowerShell, unless it's a one-word command, and I don't think there's a lot of those, are verb, noun, combinations. All switches are preceded by a dash. All variables start with the dollar sign. Um, if you're using an object, it's object dot data member. Um, arrays, you can use braces, you can use parentheses, depending on how you set up array, you can even use dot notation. Um, if you use array syntax in almost any language, PowerShell has zero surprises for you. I love not being surprised. Um, so one of the things in VS Code is they actually have a PowerShell Explorer. Give it a second here, and it'll list up. That's what it is. It's add something, add dash noun. There's a git dash noun, set. Like, you've got a couple of really small things. Those tend to be the Unixy type stuff. Add type, add member, clear, get, set. The verbs are really obvious. And again, the PowerShell site will absolutely walk you through learning how all this works. And because they have really good documentation, if you're curious as to how a command works, it will tell you these things. Um, it's also got some good built-in help for things. They actually have a built-in help command called git help. So like, let's just say that even though I wrote the module, I forgot how git mac info works. So there, this is, and you can create different levels of help, mind you. Okay, and there it is. You can write your own help. You can actually update it. You can set up a website with more help. So if someone need, if someone's, if you've updated your help data, it'll update it within the command when someone tries to get to it. And you can be very detailed in it. You can include syn syntax demonstrations, all that. This is kind of the idea when Apple went to the plist for the SDEF files for um, scripting dictionaries, that you could do that. You could have syntax demos within the dictionary so people would know how to use the command. Almost no one does it, and God knows Apple doesn't, because Apple won't dog food anything outside of the newest Swift toy. But that is, that is one of the great things about PowerShell, is once you get that, that 
verb noun combination, you're halfway, and they don't even have a whole lot of verbs. Um, they, they've, you know, it's a, it's a really small number of verbs, so you don't, you're not memorizing a long list of things. And as it turns out, even though Google is a mess for finding things these days, if you type a command, if you type in like git help PowerShell, it'll take, one of the first links will be the Microsoft page on it. So that's kind of handy. There's a free cross-platform IDE Visual Studio code. I am a long-term BB Edit person. I love me some BB Edit, I really do. But if you're going to do PowerShell, use VS Code. Two reasons, one, it integrates with PowerShell better than anything out there on any platform, okay? Two, it's, again, it runs, yes, it's Electron, Electron is awful, we can all agree, but it's not the worst Electron app, and it runs the same way on Windows as it does on Mac OS, as it does on Linux. So the muscle memory you build using VS Code here will apply there. This is kind of cool. Um, again, links, uh, this is my site looking for PowerShell. Um, I've tried to write a lot of stuff on there with some how-tos about things. If you search for PowerShell, you'll find almost all of it. Fine. I've got a couple of repositories. <laughs> um, like, like the one I did with uh, PowerShell Display Dialog. Where is, where is, there it is. And the nice thing is, unlike AppleScript, GitHub actually kind of understands PowerShell. So like, oh look, there's the code. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, it's pretty much what you expect. Display dialog, blah, 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 pipe it to user Binosa script. Um, that's, there's some PowerShell quirks that sometimes you find yourself having to work around. Like, for example, if I want to run a process in PowerShell, there's about three ways to do it. One is that where I take the parameters, I pipe it to the command, I get the results. There's also start process, which is a little bit more involved. You can, you can um, do some error handling within it, that kind of thing. And there's invoke process, which is similar to start process, but slightly different in terms of how it works. I mean, PowerShell does have its moments, it's not perfect. But, you know, this is again one of those things where I can just do the thing and I can pull out the dialogue reply which will have the button I clicked and whatever message I typed in the text field. And you can do that with, with choose file, you can do that with uh, choose folder, choose from list, and it'll spit this all out. Um, let me see here. Go back. Go back some more. Um, let's see what's next, because, okay, so before we hit the Q&A, let me dump back in here. So one of the things, as I was saying, is that you can do a lot within PowerShell to talk to different things. And so, so there's the invoke inspection, invoke expression for syscontrol, because that's the best way to get that data out of that. Um, and it's about what you expect, invoke expression, dash command, there's all your parameters. If you start process, um, it's better for more complicated things, but you put the executable name, the command name, and then the parameters in two separate um, flags. Um, but then what I'm doing once I get it out is I'm splitting the results, so, and when you run split, it converts a string into an array of strings um, with each field based on what you choose as a split character. So already you've gone from trying to grep through a string, oh, now I've got all my fields as an array, so that's a little bit easier. And then again, there's a lot of that. FD setup for that, I mean, and this is, Again, all this stuff is just generic commands. They're all generic Mac commands. I'm just shoving them, I'm just using them in PowerShell and shoving them into PowerShell variables. There's no real surprises here. But this is letting me link so many things together in one coherent format. Um, 
In case you can't tell, I am absolutely willing to flood a script with comments because I like going back to things two years later and knowing what was going on and weird that way. So this is a fun one. Anyone using PowerShell on Windows, get uptime only showed up in the, seven, in the PowerShell 7 thing. If you want to use with PowerShell 5.1, which is the default version that ships on Windows, to get uptime, you're doing a bunch of WMI commands and parsing yeah. the output of that. And I really wish they would backport get uptime to 5.1 because that is so tedious. You know, and then we're just, and so you can have, and this is all a hash table here where I'm shoving things in there, but I can also do as a sorted hash table so when it spits it out, it's already sorted in alphabetical order. I don't have to do any work. It's just how I create the hash table. Kind of handy. You know, and there's, it's doing all its little table layout and stuff like that. Like, like and again, this is, I'm not haha -ha bashing on any particular language. Apple, I, anyone knows me, I have, again, been an AppleScript fan for a long time. I think it's a very underrated language. It's, it's really easy to read. And for people who, especially someone with like a heavy SQL background, SQL to AppleScript is a heck of a lot easier than SQL to almost anything else. There's no weird dot notation, which from a SQL point of view is weird. There's not a lot of that. Um, PowerShell is kind of like that for me. It, it, I don't, the, the syntax is so consistent. Although I do have an article about application scripting and it compares doing the same thing in Excel, I think, on a Mac with AppleScript and on Windows with PowerShell. And what you realize is if you're doing any kind of application scripting, any kind of syntax uh, regularity that you're expecting just gets thrown out the window because you're dealing with application innards. Application innards are all weird and the same thing like you can have literally almost the same statement in Word versus Excel, and they mean completely different things. Like for example, anyone use format as table in Excel when you just want to be able to sort stuff real easy? Okay, that's not actually a table in Excel. That is a format. That's a style internally. If you're trying to, and I, I have to do this um, with one script, um, because I realized where I worked, there was no official list of department names and numbers. So I have to go, anyone ever use MicroStrategy? Big, it's a big enterprise query tool. So it spits out this. I basically download every employee with their department and division names <laughs> and numbers, and I just, I abuse an Excel file to an ungodly degree, so I get a CSV that has undo, you know, and it, it gets rid of duplicates, but it has the department number and the department name, the division number and the division name. And then I shove that up into Confluence. You can use, by the way, if you, anyone here have to use Confluence? There's PowerShell modules that let you shove attachments and all kinds of things up into Confluence. So if you're gonna build a Confluence page and you're using their enhanced tables, which lets you use a CSV file as a source of the table data, which is what I do, you can just show, you can, you can write a script that if you're updating it periodically, it just shoves the CSV file up in there. And as long as the name's the same, it just overwrites the old one, so you always have fresh data. Um, that was a lot easier. So now the only manual part of that entire process is downloading the original Excel file. But I wanted to format it as a table so I could sort things. And that's when I discovered <laughs> format as table is a view style, not an actual table. That took a while. <laughs> that was annoying. Um, but yeah, so you can, you can really do a lot with it. Um, I would not want the... Office team to abandon AppleScript, but if they were to replace VBA with PowerShell or maybe add PowerShell in there, I would also not complain about that. VBA is nice, but it has its weird moments. Syntax is very, VBA is very old, so the syntax is very old, and it reflects that in a lot of its inconsistencies. There is a lot of PowerShell support out there. Um, Stack Overflow has a crazy number of PowerShell answers. The only thing I'll say is if you're new to PowerShell, the, a lot of the people who answer questions on Stack Overflow are very familiar with PowerShell, and so they use a lot of the built-in abbreviations, they put a lot of stuff just on one line. So sometimes you gotta kind of get different answers to see how people do it a little bit differently and compare that with the actual syntax of the commands you're using to kind of figure out what they're doing. Power, PowerShell, one of the weirdnesses is you can use like dot underscore for like a local reference to something. And if you don't know that, you're like, what are you doing? I don't know what you're talking about here. There's no variable name. 
Um, Visual Studio Code, to its credit, if it sees a place where you can do that, will actually um, flash you up a warning where you can. It also, in addition to syntax coloring, it does a, a small amount of sanity checks on your code. So if you have an obvious syntax error, it'll flag that in red. If you're not using a variable, it'll throw a yellow underline on it. So you can say, I don't need this because I'm not using it anywhere in my code, comment it out, do whatever. Um, if you've got equality order, not so much wrong, but suboptimal, it'll tell you, hey, you should reverse this because maybe going forward in the language, the old way won't work anymore. So there's a lot of help there. Um, it's, I mean, for a free, text editor, programmer's editor. It, it, for PowerShell, again, it is absolutely the best thing I've seen. I've not seen anything come close. So, we have some time for Q&A, or I can do some more weird demos. Um, okay, let's do some demos. So, when I was talking about creating modules, where is... Okay, so git mac info. This is actually the module. There's a number of files um, to create a PowerShell module. And by the way, you can put modules in three places on a Mac. You can put it in the home directory for the person, so it's only available for that person. So if you've got local admin accounts on a machine and you don't want certain things available to everybody, you can put it in there. You can make it available to everybody on the machine. You can also put PowerShell modules on your network. So if you have to bounce from machine to machine, and you don't want to copy things down or try to put that in your deployment tree, you just want them available, you can throw it up on the network and as long as it can see the mount, it can use the module. Um, I do that a lot at work. But so there's, the P in a module, the PSM1 file is your actual code. That's the PS1 file version in the module, right? We go back here. This was the one thing where I really think they need to up their documentation. Figuring out how to build modules will make you old. It is not, this is one of those things that I think over the years, of the majority of the PowerShell community just kind of knows this. And so they haven't documented it well for people who don't. Um, but here's where you, the, the PSD1 file is where you actually do your, your support work in there. Um, Module versions, copyrights, descriptions, minimum version of PowerShell, which again, given that there are several versions of PowerShell out there, are kind of handy. Professional, you know, architecture, .NET framework. On, on a lot of this, obviously, would apply more on Windows, where you're dealing with, you know, who here gets to play .NET downloadable Visual C++ runtime module? Hell, that's awesome. I, I will say this for Apple. And I've, I, I've said if Microsoft wants to steal something, the application bundle concept would be an amazing thing to steal because when I show people at work how, so here's all the special libraries required by Word. They're in the Word bundle. They don't exist anywhere else. Well, isn't that a lot of duplication of code? Yeah, you know what I do to uninstall it? Delete. <laughs> That's it? Yeah, I don't need an uninstaller, dude. Like literally, there's the application bundles, the auto updater goes over here in library application support, and I have pretty much described the entire Office installation on a Mac. If anyone's ever tried to go rooting through a registry hive, or even just figuring out, so is this in program data, and this part's in user data roaming, but this part has to be in user data local. Oh, and I need this over here in user data local low. Oh, we're using network mounts with AD, so this is actually over here on the network, and oh my God. I, I, I will give, the, the package bundle format, which took me a long time to kind of grok the, to be honest, I didn't grok the brilliance of it until I went back into heavy Windows admin, and I'm dealing with, um, so there's a CAD 3D application called SolidWorks. SolidWorks 2020 wants VBA six point something, SolidWorks 2022, wants VBA 7, the downloadable modules. If you install 2020 first and then install 2022, everything's copacetic. But if you do it the other way, because SolidWorks is kind of like InDesign, their file format's really kind of a database type thing, so you can't backport easily. So you're working in SolidWorks 22, you're doing your little build thing and all that, but now you have a customer who only has SolidWorks 2020, and they don't want to pay. And if anyone's dealt with high-end CAM and CAD apps, 
Those are expensive. Like anyone here deal with MATLAB? Anyone deal with the difference in MATLAB toolbox costs between roaming and local? It's a factor of 10. You basically take your toolbox cost for like a one person only license, multiply it by 10, and that's what it costs for roaming. MATLAB budgets are insane. <laughs> so SOLIDWORKS is kind of like that. So they've got 2022, they want to install 2020. You have to uninstall 2022 and then install 2020. And you have to make sure that VBA module gets uninstalled too, because as we all know with Windows, because everybody's, oh, there's already this runtime here. I don't need to install my own. I'll just use this one. Well, I'm uninstalling and I need to uninstall this runtime. Look, I broke three applications. I will bag on Apple for specific things, but there are also places where they make our lives so much easier and not dealing with the runtime hell that is Windows is a huge one. Um, also, if you've ever tried to command line uninstall anything and like really totally truly uninstall it, you're gonna be using PowerShell anyways. A lot of PowerShell. Uninstalling AutoCAD is, is an adventure. Um, anyone here see Labyrinth? It's the bog of infinite stench. <laughs> it quite literally is. There's, there's no other way to put it. It is the bog. Um, but yeah, there's, there's that. Um, like I said, feel free. You know, if you have any questions, email me. I try to get to things as I can. Um, I think I'm, I'm fairly easy to find if you need to find me. Um, jwelch at binky, B-Y-N-K-I-I dot com is the email I use for most things. Um, Let's look for the vest. Oh, the vest, yeah. <laughs> so there's a site called $20 Ties that has stuff like this for, you know, ties, $20, stuff like that. There's a lot of very cheap vests. I think this was like $14. Um, I got into it. Um, as far as the tie knot goes, there's a channel, YouTube channel run by a dude named Patrick Novotny. He's got 150 tie knots. And he walks you through each of them. This is a tulip knot. Um, everybody's probably seen the Eldridge and the Trinity. He goes way beyond that. He's got one that looks like an hourglass knot. I mean, there's some really amazing stuff out there he's got. Um, but yeah, that's how, I, that's how I do the tie thing. So if no one's got any questions, I mean, we got, oh. Does drip signing work the same way as it does in Does script signing work the same way as it does in Windows? I think you would, you would use different tools. I think a signed script, if it's, as long as everything is copacetic on Windows and the Mac version can get to it, it should work. But signing it on the Mac would be very different just because Apple and the OS and the file system handle signing differently. I'm not saying you can't, I'm just saying it's gonna be different. Um, doing it, especially if you have AD set up right for signing certs, is like a one statement thing. Um, I have not tried to do it. I will say that. I probably should at some point. Back now. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, best practices for distributing PowerShell, the executable, to client machines if you were, if you wanted to use PowerShell to, you know, to yeah. script things? Sure. So when you download PowerShell regardless of version, it's a generic installer package. So you can, you can deploy that with whatever. Um, in general, the versions, there's not a huge amount of differences. I've not seen anything really break. Usually, you know, there's, there's like security updates, you know, obviously stuff like that. I haven't seen a lot of incompatibilities between like 7.2 and 7.3, that kind of thing. You don't run into that a lot. Um, as I said, the entire PowerShell distribution is in that one directory. That's where like VS Code looks by default. Um, so, if you put it somewhere else, it'll work. You just may have to do a little bit of work depending on the tooling. Um, there's no hidden surprises, because that's what I, I have a post up on my site about shoving it into an application bundle. Because I was just kind of curious, because I realized, okay, so this would be cool if it's a simple enough install. I could just, in theory, if I wanted to use PowerShell inside an Apple app, right, I could just do this, because then maybe I could, I could build the UI and then pass the UI field choices to PowerShell as parameters, right? That'd be kind of cool. And so I just shoved the whole folder up in there, and I, you, if you look at the post, obviously I was not doing anything hugely complicated, but it did allow me to reference PowerShell, and I didn't have to do any, I mean, but you do have to tell it where PowerShell is, right? But 
Other than that, it's no different than if you shove a helper app into resources. It's the same concept. That's, that's literally what you're doing is you're treating PowerShell as a helper app. Um, well, I'm not a lawyer and I've never tried. I am absolutely sure there is no way you're gonna get an entire PowerShell runtime distribution into the app store. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna go out on a limb, like by mean I'm gonna stand about here instead of here and say I don't think that'd get approved. But internally, or without using the, the App Store, you should be fine. Uh, FYI, I looked on GitHub and PowerShell is currently MIT licensed, so it's free, oh, to, do, okay. free to do whatever you want. Yes, I keep, I keep forgetting to look at that. Yeah, MIT license is, is you know, if, if the BSD license is too complicated, MIT is a good way to go. So yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're very cool about that. And I think this is one where, where it catches people off guard about Microsoft. They've got like, they're, they're weird kind of, we want to do open source, we're not sure what to do with it. But you do have some groups, PowerShell among them. I think .NET may be the same way, where they're just like, we want you to use this because ultimately the more people who use PowerShell, this benefits us long term. It's a long game, long tail. So they're just throwing it out there. You want to use it, you can. Um, I would imagine that if someone, it's possible to write a PowerShell bridge for Mac OS the same way you have like AppleScript Objective-C, which is the AppleScript bridge. You could absolutely do that. I'm not, I'm not that good. But if someone did that, that I think would be kind of a cool thing. It would probably, I know the PowerShell team would probably want to throw money at you to come work for them. Um, because I talked to them about it and they said, we'd love to, but there's not enough demand. We would absolutely do that if there was the demand. Yes? You were using uh, uh, AppleScript as a presentation layer. Yes. Um, have you had any opportunity to play, play around with possibly using uh, uh, Cocoa Dialog instead? No, I mean, I mean, I think you could use anything. Basically, why, you, because you can use, you can command line your way through di display dialogue and things like that. If you can command line your way through Cocoa Dialogue, I've never used it, but if there's a, a command line hooks into what it's showing on the screen and it can pass back those parameters in a, in a coherent way, yeah, you absolutely could. You could use almost any kind of UI tool. It, it's all about how you call it and what it sends back. And if it's sending back anything vaguely string-ish, array string-ish, it should work fine. So this isn't so much of a question as a statement, but if anyone's really new to PowerShell and they're like really excited because they want to pull things over, um, there is a difference between PowerShell and PowerShell Core. Yes. So if you find a script from five years ago that looks really cool, that doesn't have any Windows components you think is, and you start banging your head on the wall, there is some significant yes. syntax differences there. Yeah, um, and like I said, especially anything with the letters WMI or CIM, assume it will not work because those are relying on very specific Windows features to work. You can get the same results, but you're not gonna do it with the same statement. Um, yeah, there, there are, and, and sometimes it's just a matter. One thing that I think if you look in the PowerShell documentation, Microsoft is actually pretty good about saying which versions this works on. So it'd be like Windows only, that kind of thing. It's not, it's not real obvious sometimes, and I don't think they're 100% consistent on it, but they're pretty good about this does not work on anything but Windows. This is Windows only, this is. And if you're looking in PowerShell gallery, you can actually, one of the first filters you can do is operating system. So it's like Mac OS, and you watch the thousands go to you know 800. But it's a good 800, so you know, quality over quantity. Um, Hey, I do a lot of um, like batch operations using like get a, get AD user get AD user group on a PC. Any workarounds with doing that with PowerShell on the Mac? You know, even though the Mac's obviously not bound to AD for the for most of us. I mean, you what you're using for a lot of that is the Unix utilities to get you that, and so you just run the command via invoke command, start process, that kind of thing, and you get the results back, and then you PowerShell it. So, and that's, but the nice thing is that you don't have to do anything special. There's no like special shell command. You just run the shell command. Also, if you want to call PowerShell from the shell environment or from AppleScript, the command is PWSH. So you can, you can run it both ways. You can hand it parameters, which I've done, and let the PowerShell, or you can run entire PowerShell scripts. You can, you can let it do what it's good at if you want to, and then have that spit its results back out to a bash script, to Apple script, um, anyone using JXA, it'll work there too. So it's, it's, it's definitely a two-way street on that in terms of that kind of integration. Uh, 
Okay, 18 minutes early, cool. Um, thank you everyone so much for showing up. I do appreciate it. Um, and again, if there's anybody got questions later, I am easily reachable. I think they've got all my email stuff on the, on the website. So thank you so much. Are you on the Matt Gadman Slack? No. There's some reasons.